Hi guys, um, I have switched over for you eagle eyed viewers because of the time of day, the sun is shining on my face. I still need those indoor lights, but I'm still not making any money from this, so we're still going to have to cope with whatever the weather is doing out there. However, this video is for IGCSE at Excel people. Your new physics spec has a huge influx of astronomy basically, astrophysics, so we need to extend your understanding and make sure you're happy with all things to do with planets, orbits, the star, life cycle, etc, etc. So that's what I'm going to be covering in this video, including showing you how to do the various calculations involved. So let's start by looking at the solar system. So the solar system contains all the planets that you guys have heard of, and in order, starting closest to the sun, you have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and sometimes people count Pluto, but I don't think we're supposed to count it anymore because it is too small to be counted as a planet. You saw me doing my thing of remembering this. The way I remember the order of the planets is my very easy method just speeds up naming, and that is a great mnemonic for helping you remember the order of the planets. Now, more terminology, we need to look at things like the galaxy. A galaxy is made up of billions of stars, so it's a collection of billions of stars. What is the universe? Well, the universe is made up of billions of galaxies. So we on Earth are living on a teeny tiny planet which exists in a galaxy. The galaxy you do need to know the name of, it's the Milky Way, and the Milky Way is just one of billions of galaxies which make up our universe. So yeah, it's kind of mind-boggling. I try not to think about it too much because it freaks me out. Now, what holds all the planets in position? That is gravitational pull, and that's what keeps everything in position. So, for example, it keeps planets orbiting the sun, it keeps moons orbiting the planets, it keeps artificial satellites orbiting the Earth, for example, and lastly, it keeps comets orbiting the sun. Do remember that a satellite is any object which orbits the planet. There's both artificial and natural satellites. Artificial ones are ones which are man-made that we have placed into the sky, whereas a natural one is one such as the moon. Now comets, as with planets, have elliptical orbits, which means they have an oval orbit, they don't have a perfectly circular one. But the thing you'll notice with comets is they have very elliptical orbits, like a very squashed circle. And what that means is the comet travels fastest when it's closest to the sun due to increased gravitational pull and travels more slowly further away from the sun. Now what dictates the strength of the gravitational pull that will be both the mass of the planet in question, so larger planets have a stronger gravitational pull, and also the distance from the sun. So the further away a planet is from the sun, the less strong the gravitational pull will be. Very hot stars are, appear blue, and the cooler stars appear red, and the middling stars appear orange. Now the brightness of the star, this is just for triple people only. Now it's dependent on three things. First of all, you can talk about the absolute brightness. Now, when you look at the brightness of a star, it's a bit like looking at the brightness of a car at night. Now, you might look out of the window and see various cars going past and think that they're different brightnesses, but the fact of the matter is you can't look out and decide that car's lights are brighter than another unless you know how far away they are, because clearly a car which is further away will have dimmer lights, one that's basically on top of you will look very bright, but you don't know that that bright car light is actually brighter, and that's why you have to compare all of the brightnesses from the same distance. And this is also true when you look at stars. Now that's when you compare all stars as if they were the same distance away from us, and that's the fairest way of looking at the brightness of a star. You can also look at how bright a star is from the Earth, and we call that the apparent brightness, so that's not a true reflection of how bright the star is, it's just looking out into the sky and looking at how bright the star is. And lastly, you can look at the luminosity of the star, and that's a measure of the amount of light energy given off a star every second. We now need to look at the life cycle of stars, both very large stars and stars which are smaller, like our sun. First of all, we need to understand the term nebula. Now, a nebula is just a big cloud of dust and gas, and that's the beginning of a star's life. We're going to take a small star to begin with, such as our sun, and we're going to look at its life cycle. So to begin with that nebula, that big old ball of gas and dust needs to be brought together, how? Through gravitational pull. So it pulls together all that dust and gas, and then at that point it can start burning fuel, and the fuel in question is hydrogen, because the hydrogen nuclei come together, we call that nuclear fusion, because they're fusing, and they release a huge amount of both light and thermal energy. At this point the star's in its main sequence, 
it's like the adult part of its life. It will eventually run out of hydrogen fuel and it will start burning helium and then it will swell up to form a red giant. Then at this point it turns into a white dwarf and then when it totally runs out of fuel it will turn into a black dwarf. Large stars, so very very large stars, have a slightly different life cycle. They start in the same place which is that they have a nebula, so the huge dust cloud, gas cloud will be pulled together through gravity. Then it will enter its main sequence and will start burning through its hydrogen fuel. Again, nuclear fusion is occurring. However, this time when it runs out of fuel, it will turn into a huge red supergiant. And then at this point, a huge explosion occurs called a supernova. I love that word. And then dependent on the size of the star, it will either form a neutron star. And if the star is very, very massive, it will form a black hole, which you've probably heard of from films. We need to touch briefly on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and I promise it's not as complicated as it looks. It's merely a way of comparing the luminosity of a star with its surface temperature. So if you look at the diagram, going up the y-axis, we can see increasing luminosity. Across the x-axis, we can see that the temperature of the star is increasing. So if you know both the luminosity and the temperature, then you can plot on this diagram where the star is, and you can also work out at which point of its life cycle it is in, so whether it's in its main sequence or about to approach a supernova, for example. We now need to look at the Big Bang Theory. Now, please don't argue with me if you're really religious and you believe that there was a different um, way in which the Earth and everything around us became created. I'm just trying to teach you a physics video, and from a science point of view, you need to know that the Earth and the solar system, and basically the whole universe, originated from the Big Bang and what that means is that all this dust and gas all started together at one very particular point and then there was a huge explosion, the Big Bang, which sent it all whizzing out into space and formed the various millions of galaxies that we know exist in the universe today. Now the Big Bang theory has two pieces of evidence which support it. Firstly CMBR which is cosmic microwave background radiation now, if they take a photograph of space, they find that there's radiation scattered evenly throughout space. And the only way that they can decide that that occurred is due to it all beginning life in one particular place, and then the Big Bang caused it to spread out evenly throughout the universe, which is why they believe CMBR provides good evidence for the Big Bang. Next, we need to look at redshift. And to understand redshift, we need to understand the Doppler effect. Now, the Doppler effect applies to any type of wave, so we're gonna look at both sound and light waves. Now you might be aware that if you're sat in a car and an ambulance goes past you, its siren changes from being very high to lower, and that's due to the Doppler effect. Because if you imagine that sound wave as it reaches your ear, as it goes past you, as the ambulance zips off into the distance, that wave gets longer, so its wavelength increases. And then if you actually think about your physics and what you understand to do with sound waves, remember that the wavelength relates to the pitch of the sound. So if a wavelength is longer, the pitch decreases so the sound sounds lower. If the wavelength gets closer together, then you get a high pitch so it sounds higher. So that ambulance is moving off, the wavelength is increasing so it sounds lower. Now we can apply this to space, specifically galaxies. So we think that galaxies are moving away from us. So those galaxies we can see in the sky, well we can only see the Milky Way because that's the galaxy we're part of, but very strong telescopes can tell us that the galaxies are moving away. Now the light that is being emitted from stars in those distant galaxies, it reaches us on Earth. Now clearly, if the galaxy is moving away, that light wave, its wavelength will increase because the whole wave is stretched. So the galaxy moves away and that wavelength gets longer. Now if you actually look at the visible spectrum, you will see that when the wavelength gets longer, the light becomes redder, and we call this red shift which is why redshift is evidence for the Big Bang Theory, because the Big Bang Theory supports the notion that galaxies are moving away from us. Now, if that light appeared bluer, again, if you look at the colour spectrum, it would mean that the galaxy is moving closer to us because the wavelength would have gotten shorter. So, I hope this is making sense to you. Do have a look in your textbooks, but both redshift and CMBR provide good evidence for the Big Bang Theory. Now we're going to look at the Doppler equation using an example to help us. So, light emitted from the sun has a wavelength of 435 nanometers. 
A faraway galaxy emits the same light, but owing to the Doppler effect, has a different wavelength of 492 nanometers. Calculate the speed of the galaxy. The speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and state if the light has been blue or red shifted, and why. So obviously, first of all, we need the key equation, which is this. I write it out in words. It's way less confusing if you have it in words. Otherwise, it's just a load of symbols that don't really mean very much. Written out the equation, let's have a look at what we've got. I know that we're calculating the speed of the galaxy, so this value up here is x. Speed of light has been handily given to us, which is 3 times 10 to the 8. Looking at the change in wavelength, well, this is the reference wavelength. This is the new wavelength, so change means the difference between those two numbers. So let's just write it in like this. We'll have to work that out separately. And then lastly, the reference wavelength. Well, that will be the light emitted from the sun is 435. So that's everything we need. Let's do our interim calculation. So 492 minus 435 equals 57. 57 is the change in wavelength over the reference wavelength, which is 435 equals x over 3 times 10 to the 8. Let's sort out the left-hand side first of all. So do 57 divided by 435, giving us 0 0.131. Just write out that whole number, because when numbers are this small, if you round too early, you're going to make it incredibly inaccurate. So just keep it nice and written out. And then to get x by itself, you need to times both sides by 3 times 10 to the 8. And it gives us this pretty large number, which again, I'm not going to attempt to read out. And that's meters per second, so that's your final answer. State if the light has been blue or red shifted and why, so we just need to compare the two wavelengths. So the faraway galaxy is emitting a much longer wavelength, which is 492 nanometers, compared with 435. Because that wavelength has increased, we know that the light has been red shifted. So now I need to talk you through the orbital speed part of the paper. Um, I'm just going to do the whole of this question because it's all relevant. Eight. This question is about planets in the solar system. Planets in the solar system have different sizes and masses. The bar chart shows the gravitational field strength, strength of each planet compared to Earth. And we can see Jupiter has the largest gravitational field strength, which makes sense because it's the largest planet, therefore it has the largest mass. So in order to answer this question, remember the equation weight equals mass times gravitational field strength. The mass is staying the same because if you look at all the options below, they're all one kilogram. So it's just a matter of using the graph to work out which gravitational field strength is the greatest. So let's look at option A. A one kilogram mass would weigh more on Venus than on Neptune. Have a look at the graph. That's incorrect. A one kilogram mass would weigh more on Earth than on Uranus. That is correct because the bar for Earth is slightly higher than that for Uranus. But as all good scientists should do, keep checking the final two options. A one kilogram mass would weigh more on Mercury than on Saturn. That is incorrect. A one kilogram mass would weigh more on Mars than on Jupiter. Also incorrect. On Earth, the gravitational field strength is 10. Which of these is the value for the gravitational field strength on Mars? We know that the gravitational field strength for Earth is 10. And we use the graph and we can see that it has been given as 1. So obviously 10 is 1 times 10. So we need to do the same calculation when we're looking at Mars. So read off, we can say, see it's 0 0.4, multiply by that 10, and that gives us a value of 4. Deimos is a natural satellite of Mars. Deimos has an orbital time period of 1,820 minutes and an orbital speed of 1,350 meters per second. Calculate the orbital radius, and we've been given the time period and the orbital speed, so I like to underline those. And just have a quick look down here. We're in meters, so we're looking at standard SI units everywhere. And this here needs converting because minutes is not the standard SI unit. So obviously we need to convert that to seconds by doing 1,820 times 60 to get 109,200. Then we're going to write this equation, V equals 2 pi R over T. So V stands for orbital speed, R is for the orbital radius, T is for the time period. And it's a matter of substituting in numbers. So we know that the orbital speed is 1,350, 2 pi, we're looking for r. We've worked out the time period is this number. So how do we get rid of 
that 109,200, you have to times both sides by it. So times by that on both sides. And that means 1,350 times 109,200 to get this very large number, which I'm not even going to attempt to read, equals 2 pi r. To get r by itself, just divide both sides by 2 pi. So keep that number in your calculator and divide by 2 pi. And r will therefore equal this large number again. And it's up to you how many significant figures you want to give it to, seeing as they haven't specified. So I'm going to write it like this. The diagram shows Deimos in orbit around Mars, which arrow shows the direction of the force of gravity that Mars exerts on Deimos. That would be like this. So it's A. And that's because Mars is attracting Deimos, the moon, to itself. Okay, I hope you found that helpful. I know there's a huge influx of information now on this new specification, but if you do some practice questions, make sure you've nailed those calculations. It should be okay in the end. And I do think it's quite an interesting topic, actually, especially for physics. Anyway, hope you found it helpful, guys. I'll be back soon with another video.